The 2019-2020 Australian bushfire season was unusual from the start. Firstly, it began in the middle of winter, with one fire burning from the 18th of July till the 12th of February. Secondly, from the beginning, the misinformation spread about the causes of the fire were widespread and incredibly dangerous. The Guardian reported that a major social media disinformation campaign was spreading unfounded links to arson as the cause of the fires. Many Conservative members of Parliament directly blamed the Australian Greens' policies about backburning and fuel load management for causing or exacerbating the fires, even though the Greens have never been in government in any of Australian state parliaments. The reason for this overt misinformation campaign was to distract from the key direct and indirect causes of the Australian bushfire crisis. And that was the massive, ongoing drought exacerbated by anthropogenic climate change. So, here we are. Second video of 2021. What? A couple weeks after a bushfire in my home city. And we're talking bushfires, climate change, and anti-environmentalism. Australia's history with fire dates back to before written history, when indigenous fire managers would conduct cultural burns. Cool burning, knee-high blazes designed to happen continuously, moving across the landscape, consuming the kindling and leaf detritus that bushfires thrive on. Associate Professor Noel Priest, currently of James Cook University, and the man who wrote the first fire manual for the Central Australian Park Reserves, agrees that cultural burning is useful for controlling moderate fires before they start, but says that with the recent catastrophic conditions of humidity and high winds, nothing could stop these fires. Even with the moderate criticism of the practice, Priest still speaks highly positively of the indigenous experience with fire. For example, here's a paper he wrote in 2007 where he says that the government should recognise indigenous burning practices in legislation. As does Dr Richard Thornton, CEO of the Bushfire and Natural Hazards Cooperative Resource Centre, who criticised the board of his own research centre for not having any indigenous representation. Upon invasion and colonisation, the Australian landscape changed dramatically as Western European civilization imposed itself upon the landscape, clearing a landscape that was once cared for and building cities in its place. The First Nations people were pushed further and further from their land as agricultural interests moved in, further changing that landscape. Urban sprawl took over what was previously green landscapes, replacing it with a predominantly single-family dwellings. Not only a poor use of space, but bad for the environment. Now, I'm not saying that civilization is bad. I'm not an anti-civ, though now there's some compelling points to be made. My point is that the society we hold dear, the liberal democratic capitalist society that commodifies everything that could possibly be packaged and sold is directly damaging the environment in multiple ways. Fossil fuel reliance is a big one, as is the overwhelming prevalence of animal agriculture. Here we go, his big nuanced moment. Animal agriculture in itself is not a bad thing. Once again, the farming and use of animals can be a net positive on the overall landscape. Like, not just, just, just not under the thumb of capital. See indigenous land usage and restorative farming practices. Like, you can, you can do it. It's like eating. Everything in moderation. As I said above, the way we have structured and designed our cities has a massive effect on the overall landscape. Can you imagine how much cooler we would be in summer if we hadn't put billions and billions of kilos of concrete and bitumen into the ground so that huge heat-soaking metal boxes can get people from point A to point B? Would be a lot can tell you that much. Climate change is real and will require an uprooting of how society currently functions to fix. That's just how it is. But I'm not debating the merits of massive social change today, even though the merits are massive and numerous. What I'm here to talk about is anti-environmentalism and bushfires have become just another weapon in the conservative fight against social change. Because that's what it is. There is no reason that conservative thinkers and politicians can't 100% fight climate change. Like, they would be fairly weak or wishy-washy market-based solutions, but they could definitely implement them at least, at least something. No. No, the reason they choose not to is because it pays not to. Both literally, with fossil fuel and mining companies being massive conservative donors, and yeah, okay, I'm calling the ALP a little bit conservative here, you know. 
Australia has a lot of resources and they take a lot of money from miners. And because anti-environmentalism is pro-business. It's a pretty simple thing to draw a line from the Industrial Revolution to now greenhouse effect wise, even discounting the massive social issues about how our cities are designed and built. And what is the Industrial Revolution but the catalyst for the explosion of global industrial capitalism? I'd put another nuance moment here, but the people who uh, would get picky with me saying this have probably either missed me saying industrial capitalism, like industrial, or they've already clicked away. The history of state environmental conservation efforts date back to ancient India with the Lord Mahavira and the Jainist philosophy. Protection of all life through non-violence, including plant life. But modern protection legislation is first found in the Industrial Revolution when Britain passed the Alkali Acts to, you know, regulate deleterious air pollution. The bill received similar opposition within Parliament to the previous Public Health Act of 1848 and the Smoke Nuisance Abatement Act of 1853 in the debate over which one Tory MP stood up to proclaim it as un-English and unconstitutional, corrupt in its tendency. It was an avowal of the determination to destroy local self-government. And if carried, its effect would be to pass a roller over England, destroying every vestige of local preeminence and reducing all to one dull and level monotony. Doesn't that sound familiar? States' rights. This is just the start of conservative anti-environmentalism and anti-scientific rhetoric, something that follows increased safety regulation wherever it goes. Contending that federal laws prohibit the spewing forth of harmful chemicals into the air that we all breathe, conservative critics and politicians maintain one of two things. One, the problem just isn't that big a deal, and or two that the laws, regulations and programs are burdensome on business and overall far too costly. I'm getting this from Open for Business, Conservatives' Opposition to Environmental Regulation by Judith A. Laser. Crazy how there's already a wealth of academic work done in this particular field. Both of these disinformative methods work in tandem. In the same way enemies of the state must be simultaneously weak, broken and disgusting, but also strong enough to overthrow the chosen peoples if they so wished, conservatives paint climate change and global warming as both solving a non-existent problem and a scourge that only business can deal with, an issue that the state must not overly burden the might of capital with. Even when you point out that the true costs of environmental devastation may not just be monetary, but will have a direct weight in human lives, they don't seem to care. The word seem is, is doing a lot there, so I'm going to just remove it from the sentence. So. They don't care. Either they're idiots who cannot comprehend what the number 97 means, or they are willfully driving the car, the analogy requires it be a car, with us strapped into the back seat off of a cliff. Conservatives have all the power in this scenario. They own the media networks that run the news stories and the adverts and the massively popular pundits that change the minds of the people that watch. My theory, and what I mean by my theory, is the academic consensus on the issue. The theory that right-wing governments have to demonise the users of social programmes in order to cut and privatise them, covered in detail here, rings true once more. But this time it's not the users because that's everyone. We all breathe air and drink water. This time, conservatives demonize the science, the scientists, and any other virtue signaling cuck trying to take away my God-given right to drive a Hummer while eating a triple beef cheeseburger and leaving my house lights on all day. This is the part of the video where I'd normally play a bunch of clips that illustrate my point. Like, you know, the ones Tucker Carlson talking about the climate strike, uh, some bearded white dude sitting in his car talking about a cabal of secret leftists and Jews creating climate change for nefarious purposes, that kind of thing. But I like to think that my audience doesn't need that kind of hand wavy on the nose stuff for my point to get across. And they don't, but I'm sure there's some centrist devil's advocate in the comments ready to jump down my throat with a not all conservative, so here's your damn clip show. They went on television with a partisan talking point. Climate change, they said, caused these fires. They didn't explain how exactly that happened. How did climate change do that? They didn't tell us, but they just kept saying it. Children like Greta Thunberg, they think that the end of the world is coming, they'll be wiped out, should get a different perspective. 
none of the coverage I saw bothered to point out that whether you argue it's not enough or it's too much, it's simply flying in the face of reality to say that the government is not doing anything for climate change. Huge chunks of ice just falling into the ocean, raising the sea levels. And you don't know whether or not that would have happened with or without man. You don't know. Well, you're scientists. You're scientists at no, NOAA we have, and we have NASA. scientists that disagree with that. You know, Children completely brainwashed. Just saying what is the exact opposite of the truth. I'm, and I acknowledge that the two people who died were most likely are people who voted for the Green Party. So and this is why we have such a strong contingent of society that seemingly gets away with entirely anti-scientific views. This is obviously a much wider phenomenon. Michael Gove said it, Australian pundits said the same shit about COVID. But I can see the exact same insane conspiracy beliefs being pushed for the wildfires last year in California, Oregon and Washington State, as got pushed here with the exact same predictable result. Homes are destroyed and people have died. And yet people like the son of the former president share shit like this. That is factually incorrect. During the Australian fires, the hashtag arson emergency trended and it was wrong. Again, factually incorrect. But in this case, it was pushed by bots and troll accounts. One of the worst pieces of disinformation being spread is that environmentalists and greenies are preventing hazard burning in national parks and that's why the bushfires are so bad. And this one comes up every single time in Australia and in the US and it's ridiculous. Why don't these pundits talk about how California is drier than ever? A direct result of climate change. In Australia, why did the Prime Minister and the Water Minister downplay the role that climate change has had on the landscape even though 24 of Australia's former fire chiefs openly criticised the government for not following their advice when it came to climate change. Former fire chiefs have blamed climate change and government inaction. We're calling on the federal government to take emergency measures to equip our firefighters and emergency personnel with the tools they need to keep lives and property safe. But we're also calling on the government to take urgent action on the fundamental problem that's leading to these catastrophic fires, and that's climate change. What's very unusual is that these fires are now impacting on areas that haven't known fire for millennia. There's old growth forests, rainforests, there's alpine areas, uh, sphagnum mogs, bogs that have been impacted by the fires and uh, there are areas where normally swampy areas which would normally hold the fire are now so dry that there's no way that they can hold the fire and putting a lot of strain on firefighters in the field. To bring us full circle, why did the conservative talking heads in both the US and Australia bring up inner city greenies preventing hazard reduction burns in major bushfire zones when the people who actually know what they're talking about refute that as a cause of the fires? Because they don't care about you your family, or the families of those in the affected areas. If they did, they would have made decisive action on climate change years ago. Instead, the current Australian government's policy cut the equivalent of only 0.01% of the annual greenhouse gas pollution in the country. Because the goal isn't to truly cut emissions. It's to appear as if you're doing something, whilst really doing nothing at all. Let business be business, Get the hell out of the way. And that's why we need a true social upheaval. Because business will never change. They have no incentive to. Their whole job, their fiduciary responsibility isn't to society. It's to shareholders. To the market. Even when the market is... Ridiculous. Radical change is the only way forward, but with these fools in charge, that just won't happen. To be honest, with anyone in charge, nothing will happen. But that's another video. Climate strikes once a year are great, but they're not good enough. And the strike every week, every day, because otherwise nothing will ever change. We want to protest against ScoMo and a Diane Cole. Yeah, because we don't like ScoMo and we want him out of the industry. He's not in the industry, he's the Prime Minister. Yeah. The Prime Minister industry. The kids are all right.